field. They got to stay in isolated areas. So you don't really get the chance to see one-on-one some of the stuff. So that's kind of why I kind of like, I'm lucky I have some friends out there that give me a little bit of intel. So between John and what we're doing, um, I think we're giving you probably the best coverage that we possibly can here for you. Don't forget to check out a lot more of the uh, videos there at Jacob Sports. Our friend Xander Krause joins us now from Birds 365. And there's no doubt, Xander. I mean, they're working hard, brother. They're working hard good, as they should be. It's good to hear. It seems like a lot of good things are coming out of camp this year. Uh, optimistic for the year, but my favorite thing going on in camp is definitely the Quinion Mitchell stuff, as we've talked about on several occasions. But so far, so good, Big Sales, coming out of Eagles camp. Hour 40 minutes, and I heard you say this. You know, hey, you know, it's not going to be like old school. But today in today's NFL, Xander. That's pretty good. An hour and 40 minutes. Remember something, last two years? Practices I looked it up were between 45 and 55 minutes. So they're 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 putting more work in with more reps because of the new coordinators. You would have thought they would have done the same shit last year, but there seemingly is more of an emphasis, especially on conditioning. So they're working harder in this camp and they're doing more reps. Yeah, I agree. And I I made a stupid comment too talking about it. People are people were ripping me. They're like you're sitting at a fucking desk in air conditioning and you're crying about an hour, 40 minutes. And I, all right. It was a dumb comment. I understand it was a dumb comment, but no, you're right. It, it is pretty good. Honestly, an hour, 40 minutes out there uh, in the heat, you know, with the full pads on, I think it's good. And, you know, I think they need it though. You know, I think they all understand that too. They're coming off of obviously a huge collapse and it wasn't pretty. And I think they all understand the moment and they're, and they seem to be locked in and they're willing to go the extra extra distance. I mean, you say it's not Sirianni. It might be a little bit of him. I mean, a little bit. I mean, listen, I like, like John has said before, I don't think there's any coach in the NFL who wants to practice less. I think they understand why you do it when you're trying to keep guys healthy, but uh, I think they're willing to practice more. And I think the organ, I think you're right. The organization has given them the leeway to practice more, but I think Sirianni likes it. Um, but overall so far, so good, man. I think it's been a lot of positive coming out of, uh, coming out of camp so far definitely making me very optimistic for the year obviously you're look, looking at a very talented team um and if you can get some of these younger guys on defense to step up you know you have a chance to be a really good football team this year and a key word is a chance you have a chance to be a great football team doesn't mean you're gonna be but they have a chance to be a great football team and that's what we that's really all we can ask for at this point i think coaches are smarter today um because back in the day they always thought more was more now less is more and I think that when you're putting a priority on certain situations, nine on seven, seven on seven, one on one, team drills, or you want to do um, scrimmaging, or you want to do, I think there's more of an emphasis on getting to the point instead of just doing drills to do drills. You know, when you're out there for three hours, three days for a month and a half, and you're doing those, you eventually, Xander, run out of shit to do. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're just doing shit to do it. Yeah. And I always thought, in my opinion, that that was just an over, it, it was just overkill. And now I think they're smarter today. Let me get to Quinion Mitchell here a little bit as an overview. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about what he said. I said this to you. And when there's 53 chairs in 32 cities, you're going to have the most competitive people on the planet fighting for one of those 53 seats. So when you're hearing people are competitive, it's a great thing because you know why? There's no place in the world that has these type of seats. You're going to have guys that are fighting tooth and nail to get one of those chairs. I've been in them rooms. And some of the most heated conversations, some of the most incredible competition you could – dude, you could have a competition on who's going to get to one chair before you do because everything is so competitive. Who gets to the ice cream machine first? Who gets to the Coke machine Every single thing you're doing in those facilities at Novacare right now, people are high energy competitive right now. Everything you're doing. So it is really an intense place to be. And when you hear Quinion Mitchell doing this, Xander, he's going against AJ Brown. Bro, I can't tell you that's like going to Harvard or Penn. Getting an education by one of the greatest teachers on the planet to teach you being a uh, a, a brain surgeon is sitting there and going against and being around people that are the best at their profession. There's no way he's not benefiting from lining up against AJ Brown 
And it's really a crash course. It's really lucky that they have two guys like that on both ends. Yeah, and you said that it sills to your point. That was one of the first comments you made when we drafted Quinion Mitchell and Cooper DeGene was these guys are going to be ahead of the curve come week one simply because they're playing against two of the best wide receivers in the NFL in practice every day. And when you hear Quinion Mitchell lining up with A.J. Brown, I mean, how quick is that going to help him develop? He doesn't even he doesn't even have to wait for the for the games to start to go up against the premier receiver like that. And I'm sure AJ Brown is giving them, you know, giving it to him. They're trash talking. You're hearing they're jabbing back and forth. You know, they're uh, Quinion's forcing them out of bounds. So it's really good stuff. Uh, but overall, it really seems like Quinion Mitchell is, is uh, coming along really quickly. I mean, John McMullen said he's been comfortable at every position they put him in slot, outside, right side, left side. Doesn't matter where they put him. Uh, it'll be interesting to see, you know, where they end up with him when the season comes. I thought you made a you know, a tough comment yesterday, but a true comment that Cooper DeGene going down, you know, helped, helped Quinion Mitchell. It's a tough realization. I know, I know, but that's part of the game. That's part but of it. But it's opportunity. It's opportunity. Right. And it's, and it's fallen in Quinion's lap and he's capitalized on it to the fullest extent. And boy, I feel good about the guy we picked in round one. And, you know, I said this on the show earlier, whenever a guy's taken, you know, and, and there's another guy at the same position taken right after him, they're, they're, they're basically compared for their whole entire career. It, you know, you go back to the Jalen Rager pick and just anybody that's ever, Roethlisberger, Rivers, right. and Eli. And yeah, I mean, look at all the quarterbacks that are picked, right, that are constantly compared, not just back that far, but even in recent years where yep. Josh Allen and Mitch Trubisky are taken yep. in the same draft. You know, and, and even the Mahomes draft where he was taken 10th or 11th overall. Um, so everybody gets compared. I feel like we got one here. You know, Tara, I hope he has a great career. But I feel like we got our guy in Quinion Mitchell, and I'm happy with the pick. Now, we'll see how it pans out. We're just a couple days in the training camp here. Doesn't mean he's going to be a great player. But so far, he's doing all the right things, saying all the right things, and you know it appears that he's playing like he should be playing here in camp. So very positive start for Quinion Mitchell here in camp. This is what I've learned about um, what they're doing with him. So the Eagles um, are basically coaching him the same way Vic coached Patrick Sertan in Denver. Mm. They're putting him at every single position, nickel, dime, slot, and corner two. Right. So what they're doing is, you see what they're doing, Xander? They're letting him see the middle of the field from the slot. He sees it from the half hash at the corner. When he's in, when he's when he's in dime, he sees it when it's third, and you've got dime personnel out there. So he's seeing the four wide receiver set. He is what he's doing right now is giving him a crash course. Right on how to see and get this. He's teaching him communication up and down the line on what the free and strong is going to say to him to recognize what they're trying to do in the slot, what they're doing at the wire, what they're trying to do at the Z. So they're giving him a bird's eye view. This is exactly how they taught certain. So what it does, and when you have players, so get this, you got Vic teaching him like that. You got Devontae and AJ having that come at him like that. You know, I know they had Isaiah Rogers out there in CB2, but um, I, I, I think their objective is to get him up to speed. And the more they get him up to speed, I just think it's a matter of time that James Bradbury will be whacked off this team. Yeah, I do too. It's interesting to see, you know, why it's almost like why have they gone this route? The security with blanket. Yeah, it's true. And, you know, I like Isaiah Rogers. We'll see what he turns out to be. It really, I, I know, but, you know, the, the interesting thing is, Vic is moving all these dudes around all over the place constantly. Like even John, I'm like, so are you getting any even inkling? Like who's going to be the starting linebackers? Who's the starting corners? He's like, I mean, yeah, but Vic is moving everybody everywhere right now with the exception of your main guys. Like Jalen Carter's obviously where he is. Some of those guys, but linebackers are rotating all over the place. Corners, all of them have gotten, gotten reps at every position basically, you know, so it'll be interesting to see what they end up doing back there. Um, but, you know, it's very positive, you know, development so far here in camp. And Prince is dead right here. You know, last year, Dak was throwing a ton of interceptions in, in camp and he only threw seven all year. So, again, that's what Xander was saying about temper yourselves. Make it easy here. Let's keep things in perspective here. So I'll tell you what they're doing, too. Moving a lot of people around. I mean... They're just moving everybody as they can possibly move around on that offense and on defense. People, It's a different-looking approach, Xander, 
on both sides of the football. And it's encouraging when you're hearing that. Should they keep Bradbury? Great question. Um, I'd keep him for the first month. That's where I'm at. I'm, I'm, I'm almost getting to a point where he's been here now. He's been here this long. He's been out on the, on, you know, out on the field for practice. You, despite how good we all feel about Quinion and Cooper and yep. Keely and Isaiah, why not? I mean, you're already – he's already – Keep him to the here. bye. Right. Keep him at least for a couple of weeks. See what you got. You know yep. what I mean? And if you're if you're not looking to compete this year, all right, it's a different story. But if they want to make a run in the Super Bowl, I think you got to keep these guys on the roster and see at least what you have. And, you know, trying to win in 2024 is a different goal and a different team than trying to build a team that works for the next couple of years. Those are two different objectives. So if they're not building for the Super Bowl this year, all right, move off of them. What the hell? You don't need them here at all. But if they're trying to compete this year, I think it's worth it to keep a guy like that on the roster, especially Slay too. You know, we talked about Slay, and I and I was one of the guys who brought it up on the shows, you know, thanks to our girl Marie de Booth in the, in the chat who brought it up to me back in the summer. You know, should we trade Slay? And – should we should we think about getting these young guys on the field? And I entertained it in the summer, but the more I you know think about it, and the more we've developed here in camp, if you want to win in twenty twenty four, you got to keep some vets on your roster, even if they're not what they once were. They have a they have a role in this team, a role in to help you win, a role to help these young guys, a role you know to to win football games in the here and in the now. And I think and if you buy into that role, we could keep you on the roster for another year and. It can extend your NFL career because That's teams true. like that. It's not here. It's not here, like too, another spot, you know, if not here, another place. That's I right. I will probably hang them up after this year. Maybe not. But, you know, Bradbury, I think, is looking to continue his career a little bit for sure. Guys, please hit the like button. We appreciate you oh, doing that. It, here. So I was killing it on the like button. We're at 158, brother. 158. Thank you guys for the likes, man. You guys are the best. Absolutely. Hey, Prince, by the way, I love you, too, honey. It's all good, <laughs> sweetheart. <laughs> I love Prince, man. He and I go back and forth. Prince is Here's funny, something funny, that I heard. Dude. Here is Pads Day. Now, Hertz had six touchdowns and no picks. However, majority of those were down in the red zone. But I also heard this, that there was a lot of plays out there that they missed. And there were a lot of opportunities out there that they weren't able to get the ball into the end zone, where, again, you had 39 reps down there, and you were doing all this. And at the end of the day, the defense did do well. It's set up for offense. So six TDs and no picks. That sounds great. Keely Ringo, he threw it right to his chest and he dropped it. Yeah. Not saying that he, and by the way, I am not saying he played bad. That's not what I'm saying here. I'm saying that the defense did a little bit better than more than what's being reported. Yeah, they're starting to take a little bit of strides forward. You also heard that from yesterday too, where the defense, you know, John said that yesterday was the first day he thought the defense won the day. Uh, which was interesting. I didn't get that update from him until this morning because I didn't have a chance to talk to him after practice yesterday. But, uh, yeah, the defense is, is playing good. I mean, that, look, it, it's passing camp, and, and, you know, it's good to hear that the, that the offense is, is doing good. I also don't care that, you know, there's a ball that went through Keely Ringo's hands. I'm not expecting Jalen Hurts to throw the ball perfect every single day, every single rep, every single down. I mean, at the end of the day, if, if that's what he's doing, then he's not working on things that are going to improve his game in the season. So this is the time, right, to try and fit it in those tight windows, to try and, you know, push plays and, and do things that are outside your comfort zone because you learn more, you can get better, and that's the time to do it. So I don't have a problem with, you know, a couple of plays not being what it is or not getting in the end zone enough or, you know, an interception, Keely Ringo. Like Prince pointed out, I think it was Prince, who just, like, like last year, Dak Prescott, tons of interceptions and then none during the season. Yeah, he was probably trying a lot of stuff in practice, you know, and that probably helped him in the year. So I think there should be a delicate balance of those two things yep. where you're trying to get, you're trying to optimize your offense, but you're also looking to push the needle forward to where you can get better, you can improve, and you can try things you might not try in a game. This is what I don't like what Hurts did today. Bro, when you're down in the red zone and you're there inside the five or you're inside the 10, you can't hold the ball. It's got to get out, man. Yeah. You, you don't have time. To, to sit yeah, back here the the that hurts, right? Like here, and I agree with that. And I agree with that for sure. But the other thing that you do get with Hertz, and you know, you love to say the word dual threat. Where are my people in the chat? Give me the dual threat emojis. But that's <laughs> that's the one thing you get that's an advantage. Where in practice, you're never going to be able to quantify that because 
when they blow the play dead, the play is dead. But sometimes, and you've seen it many times in Jalen Hurts' Eagles career, when the play breaks down, especially in the red zone, they may not be asking. They may not, they may well, they're not letting him. Yeah, they blow the play dead. Exactly. But uh, yep. in, in a real life scenario, yep. Jalen Hurts. That's sometimes the things where it's like it's yep. great to have a dual threat quarterback. He yep. sneaks outside the pocket, the play breaks down, and boom, he gets you yep. six or seven yards closer to the end zone. Or you know, I go back to the. The one game, shoot, I forget what game that was, his first year starting, and he sticks his leg in the ground. I think it was the New Orleans Saints game. Yeah. And he just ju jukes the guy out of his socks and gets into the end zone. So that's where I think you can't you can't quantify that in practice because they blow the plays dead. But having that extra ability of the quarterback, if he can bring up the rest of his game as well, you know, that becomes really lethal in crunch time when the games are being played. And you can't really you can't you can't put a, you know, you can't quantify that in practice right now because they don't allow for it to develop. So, you know, sometimes the practice stats are misleading, especially when you have a quarterback like Jalen Hurts. You know, if you're like Joe Burrow or a guy who's a statue in the pocket a little bit more, yeah, you got to get that ball out because you know it's going to be a sack in real life. Uh, so it's a little different for Jalen Hurts, but I do hear what you're saying. For the sake of practice and what we just talked about, practicing things that you're not great at, pushing things that make you go outside your comfort zone, yeah, he's got to get that ball out. And I think he's done a pretty good job at it so far. Uh, but it's a good question, and I'll definitely bring it up with John uh, tonight on our nighttime edition of Birds 365, you know, how Hurts looks and reading it quickly and getting that ball out, especially in the red zone. They did a lot of red zone work today. You know, and again, I want to make sure that and, – and by the way, you make sure you put an emphasis to John in his ear if it's landing wrong that I'm saying something about – that motion stuff, because everyone's noticing it now. And you're seeing a lot of that. So as we go into some of the comments that are being made by Grant Calcaterra and also by Quinion Mitchell, because I'm going to get to those here in a second, I want people to understand that it's a development tool that they're helping Jalen Hurts with. Now let me get to Grant here. Um, He's had a great offseason, as I said yesterday. Also said when he was asked a question today, uh, he was one of the guys at the podium. Um, he said that they're telling him that he's a better blocker and he's also been a better pass catcher. Here's a seventh rounder that now is going to be a point where you're hearing two tight end set. He was asked the question, are you seeing a lot of more two tight end set? Can you imagine having a two tight end set down there on the goal line where you've got two tight ends, you've got Brown and you've got Devontae and Barkley and you've got Hertz attacking the red zone. When you've got that set up with that offensive line, bro, I'm telling you, I'm not sure how you defend that. You don't. I don't think the you only do. way you defend yeah. it is with a gun because there's no <laughs> way you're stopping that thing, man. I mean, there's just too many areas of the football team and they're too versatile. So this guy's he's also bringing something to the table. That's player development, too, dude. That's really good by him because he's a seventh rounder. Yeah. And, you know, I think the reason he was a seventh rounder is some of the injury history. I'm not sure okay. if you're aware of some of that. I wasn't. Um, yeah. He retired from football. Okay. Because of concussions. And then he came back to the game uh, and, and was drafted late in the seventh round. Now, he was a player at Oklahoma with Jalen Hurts. He was a very good player in college, a very good pass. That's uh, where I heard that name. Yeah, so that's the worry with him is that if he takes one more head hit, uh, you're in danger zone with him. And he knows that, obviously, a guy that nearly walked away from the game for good. Uh, and that's part of what dropped his draft stock down to the seventh round. And – you know, I thought it was a good pick by the Eagles at the time because he was a really good player in college, like a lot he better was. than the seventh rounder. Yeah, he was a really good player. He's like a third rounder. Yeah. Um, so, but we'll see. I think he's going to be an impact in the passing game. But boy, you just laid it out. I mean, holy shit. How do you block? How do you guard that? I mean, and, and you had Dave Wanstead on who talked a little bit about that. That's where I think Saquon Barkley is going to be the most effective for this team is when you have situations like that and it's like, okay. I'm going to choose to take away AJ or I'm going to blanket the receivers or I'm going to, you know, do a dime coverage and, and take away the passing game. You still got to account for Jalen Hurts' legs and you still got to account for Saquon Barkley. And now you're going to add in two tight ends. Like this is, this is tough stuff for the defense to cover. If you're not, you know, a fully stacked defense, I don't know what you can do other than hope other than pray that they don't, that they don't, you know, execute the play properly. So if this team can, can figure it out and, and get in rhythm, they're going to be a tough team to stop on offense. They really are. I asked the, the uh, our viewers here this question. I'm going to ask you this. When Kellen Moore, and this is Calcaterra talking, Grant Calcaterra talking, he was asked a question about uh, Kellen's offense. He says, 
it's a clearly a, a progression style offense. You know what that means, right? That means everybody's an option. Yeah. That's not just this. You're two dudes over here, and maybe your wide, your tight end are going to be the targets. What they're doing this year compared to a year ago, that quarterback now has to do pass protection, and he has to do this. Everybody is open. He can't have a pre-snap destination where he's throwing like a year ago. We saw that especially in the Seattle game. Yeah, When you saw him throw in the double coverage versus A.J. and Devontae was wide open underneath, why didn't you go to the easier throw? What he's doing now is that everyone's an option, which means this. Everybody's going to be giving you decoy routes. They're going to be running. Jalen has got to spot this. That's why that motion is important, Xander. Yeah. When you run the motion and you're running all that and you got progression reading, he's going to know, well, that just moved the safety over. Well, that means the middle of the field with the tight end or maybe even a dump-off pass to the running back is going to be my second and third option. Let's go to the first option. He's going to be going to AJ. If he's covered, dude, you go to tight end or back. I mean, yeah. that's the thing that he's going to be doing that's going to be completely different than a year ago. Yeah, and that's where I think Kellen Moore is just going to – that's why I think he's going to be a great coordinator for this team. I know there's some you know, some pushback on him, and this is what I've been most excited about is Kellen Moore's ability to do that, to add that dimension to the offense. And you know, when you think about some of the talent they have and how they're able to set this thing up, I mean, Kellen's added some of those dimensions that, like you just said, I mean, last year was so predictable, even with all the talent on the field. And he's moving guys around. I mean – you know, Bob, where's our good buddy Bob Brown? Just brought it up in the chat. Uh, let me find it. Red zone, situational football. You can add in a guy like a six foot seven Johnny Wilson. I mean, I don't need him to be a big impact player, but just catch the ball in the red zone here and there. I mean, the, the situation. Go get it. Yeah, the, 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 the play calling, the situational football, as Bob points out, that we can do. And I think that Kellen's creative enough to get us into. It's really a scary thought. So if they can figure this thing out and make it work and, you know, re remain cohesive as a unit and, you know, the leadership is intact and, you know, nobody's crying about their touches, it's going to be a nasty offense, Big Sills. It really I'm is. Gonna, I'm going to throw this at you as well for Kellen. This is a big year for him. Yeah, huge. Because huge. if you want to use the excuse that Dak Prescott is a loser, he can't win and move on a football team to the divisional round, or a second round of a playoff, okay, and it's on him. That's one thing. Okay, Kellen was his coordinator for a couple of them years down there in, in, in Dallas, but if you want to blame Dak, that's fine. Well, if he doesn't get out of the opening round of a playoff with all that talent, he has no more excuses, Xander. He yeah, has no I mean, excuses. Remember, this is three teams in three years. Yeah, he he's he's got to show, okay, because to me, I'll tell you what, I, I have my doubts on this. You know, Todd Munkin had a great year last year. They were 14 and three. They won home field advantage in Baltimore. And your quarterback was the AFC, uh, most, or he was the NFL most valuable player. Fantastic. Home field advantage, all that. You got to the playoffs, you shit the bed against Kansas City. Hey, Todd, what are you doing throwing that guy 37 passes? That's not how he's going to beat Mahomes. He's a dual threat guy. You can't have him trying to get back into a passing match. You're going to get into a you're going to get into a, a pitch and catch uh, game with Patrick Mahomes. You're going to lose that game. I know. It's true. Okay. Yeah, it's true. No doubt about it. I mean, we'll see what they end up doing. I think Kellen's got to be aware of that, too, you know, with the, with, the, with the quarterback that he has. It's a different look for him, obviously, as you've pointed out many times. So I think he's going to, I think he'll, I think he'll be up for the challenge, though. Like you said, three, year, three teams in three years, and you got one of the best offenses in the NFL right now, Kellen. Pressure's on him as well. Absolutely. You go from Justin Herbert to Jalen Hurts, yeah. and you're not doing yeah. anything with that? That's a you yeah. thing, pal. I know. Um, here's something that Grant said that kind of uh, corroborates a little bit what Jalen was saying. He said this when asked the question. Yeah, there was a lot of change at first. So when I got to the offense, it was a little bit confusing, but we've kind of picked it up now, and we're understanding a little bit more of the terminology. So – it must have been a real struggle in them OTAs and minicamp for what they were trying to really tell them what a play was, how it looked, because now they look a lot smoother. He looks more in control. So to cooperate a little bit on Jalen Hurts, that shows you right there. Even Grant said, hey, man, that offense was way different when we first implemented it in OTAs and minicamp. So 
Jalen was right. It is a lot different, and but they're adapting to it, which is great. Quickly. I mean, they're quickly. adapting, they're adapting quickly. quickly. I mean, this is a big jump from what you heard at OTAs. I mean, OTAs were not pretty. I mean, looking back on them, you know, we didn't want to make too much of it because it was spring football, but – you heard all negative reports on the offense. This 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 training camp, it's been all offense all the time. And they've been playing good. Jalen's been playing good. And there's also, you know, I like hearing there's a lot of underneath stuff too because I think that shows that Jalen's going to be, you know, at least he's being taught. Don't be afraid to take what the defense gives you, you know, and, and that's good. Jalen needs to add that to his game. That will help him. You don't always need the big play. You don't always need to go all the way downfield. You don't always need to target A.J. Brown. You don't always need to do these great things and, and win the game. We had the same issue with Carson Wentz, remember? I mean, yeah. he wanted to play hero ball, and Jalen's a different style of it, but sometimes I'd love to see him take what's given to him a little bit, and I think Kellen Moore is bringing that into the offense, and it's going to help him a lot. Here, here's, here's the thing here, a ton of movement and motion. He goes, it is, we are moving – and remember something too. You don't put motion into your offensive play calling and into your play designs just to fucking put them in there. Everything has a meaning, whether it's a decoy, it is a um you're you're trying to move safeties around or corners or slot guys, you're a nickel. There is no question the reason that they're doing this to help Hertz be a progression reader. When you move any kind of mo how about dual motion? You know, when you move dual motion, they're hoping to run the they're they're hoping to run a corner and a safety into one another. Remember what happened in the Super Bowl? Um, when Andy Reid or with Jim Schwartz was sitting there. I mean, remember what Andy Reid did to the Eagles secondary? Who was it? Slayer? Was it Bradbury or somebody it ran into one another? Time, and then I think it was was it CJ Gardner Johnson on the other Remember side? Remember they were run, running those crossing routes yeah. and they were running into one another. That's yeah. fucking motion, dude. I know, bro. I know. That's I said that to John. Back. I'm like, and and by the way, Andy used it in the Super Bowl last year versus versus the 49ers. The same exact play, and it worked again in the Super Bowl on the biggest stage. So uh, there's no doubt about it. The motion thing is big. I think it was a little bit of a misunderstanding with John there. I think he understands that motion is a positive thing. I think he was more put off by me saying it could help Jalen read the defense, which maybe he's right. Maybe it doesn't. I mean, I don't no, I know. I think it does, hundred percent. I do too, but like I said, I'll agree to disagree. Okay, yeah, agree to disagree. Yeah, I mean, whatever. If he doesn't think it will help Jalen at all, I think it opens things up. I think it can give Jalen a chance at least to see more of what's going on on the field by implementing things that you're in control of. But anyway, like I said, agree to disagree. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 no. It's it's not it's not an attack in any way. But remember something: the quarterback when he shows you with emotion how you move a, a safety, you're telling me that that doesn't help him understand what coverages right. they're trying to throw at you. On the pre-snap before the ball is snap, yeah, that helps you understand why you're calling that play. Okay, let's move on. Um, no, you're right though. You're what you are right for sure. Here's Quinion Mitchell. By the way, before I get to him, Xander, I had never heard Michael Clay talk. He's good, dude. He sounded like John Harbaugh. He's good, right? Yeah, yeah he's good. I, I like Michael Clay. Pretty impressed with him. Yeah, I, I am too. I, I'm. I've always been impressed with him. That's why I was so upset. Like that one year when our special team sucked. After First the year, two thousand one, two thousand twenty-one. No, I think it was twenty-two. Right, the Super Bowl year. Was it? No, no, no. It was twenty-one. It was twenty-one. It no, was twenty-one. Year did, they weren't very good. Want him fired? You no, know, it was twenty. Wasn't it? No, Super Bowl year. He had a good year. No, yeah, but the super, but the, but the special teams nearly cost us in the game. Oh, that's right. The punt. Maybe yeah, it was twenty-two. And, yeah, I don't. I forget which year it was, but there was there was a time when a lot of people yeah. wanted Michael Clay gone. He's a smart guy. I mean, he you know he he knows how to answer the questions. He's definitely you could definitely tell that he's a smart dude. I think he has a future in the league. He's he's smart though. Uh, we'll see. This this kickoff thing's kind of weird, right? Sills, what do you, what well, do you make it? They're changing now. They're that now what they're doing. They're putting a like a like a like a new quirk in the kickoff or punt return. And I'm like, this comes back down to the competition committee. And I don't get it. And I'm like, man, you know, I don't what? love that they, they took away the ball. onsiders. I don't mm -hmm. like that they took away the onside kicks for the fourth quarter. You know what you're going to get then? You're going to get more contact. You know, the things that they're trying to get away from with these new rules, you're going to get more contact yeah, in these true. special teams plays now. You're trying to yeah. get away from contact. And the one thing you're creating is more contact. I know. That's true. I mean, I, I, I just get this. 
I mean, Devin Hester, in my opinion, if he played in today's NFL with these new rules, this guy'd have 25 touchdowns. Oh my God. <laughs> Devin Hester. I'd love to have a guy like that. He was one of my favorite players of all time when I was Remember a young Brian kid. Mitchell too, the Most because of Madden. I used to play. I'm not a video game guy now at all, but I used to play Madden when I was a kid. <laughs> I'm sure you did it, Big Sills. That's yeah. a, after yeah. your time. But we, I used to just freaking put Devin Hester back there and, and do kickoffs all damn day and just return it with Devin Hester. What a player he was. He would thrive in this new kickup kickoff setup he's probably still licking his chops right now while as he's as he's gonna watch it unfold this year quinion mitchell got in front of the mic yeah first time i really got a good sense of what he's about and he was talking about aj and how these guys are going back and forth and they're talking shit to one another and i think that creates a really great dynamic and also what it does is you know i think you have to have an attitude out there at corner i think you have to have an ego I think the cornerbacks in the NFL have to have the same ego that wide receivers have to oh, play a doubt, situation man. like that because you're on an island, dude. You're running backwards. Xander, I've said this before. The hardest position to play physically in the NFL is corner. You're running backwards against elite speedsters and some of the greatest athletes on the planet. And yeah, when you've got a guy out there that's going step for step with A.J. Brown, that's good stuff in what you're hearing. You know what else you need if you're playing corner? You need a short effing memory. Yep. You know, I was a goalie when I when I played hockey, and I was, you know, I, I spent a lot of time as a goaltender, and, and that used to be the number one thing my pop would tell me. You let in a goal, you, you got that, you got to forget about that goal before the puck drops at the center of the ice. And it's the same thing with cornerbacks, man. You get beat, you gotta, you gotta forget about it and get back and get ready to play. So you're right. I mean, it's one of the positions that's probably the most mentally tasking in the NFL, like you said. I'm backpedaling versus the greatest athletes on the planet. It's not an easy job. You know, it's probably the hardest position to play in the entire NFL. That's why I know white dudes, are, white dudes are out there. You need the best athletes in the world out there doing it. And, uh, you know, no, no doubt about it. And, and I like that about Quinion because he's not real flamboyant about it. Like he's more, no, he's, he's, from, he's from humble beginnings. And he's quiet about it, but when the, when the, when it comes to you know put up or shut up, he's trash talking out there. He's saying what needs to be said. You remember the story of AJ Brown in in a OTAs right after they drafted Quinion, and he's like, I didn't hear this dude say an effing word to me, and I go out and line up against him in practice, and he goes trash route. That's the first words he said to me. You know, so you kind of see that he's got that competitive juice. He's just a little bit more of a I don't know I don't know maybe an introverted type of guy or just a you know, a more subdued guy, but that's great. It's good to know that he's got that, I guess you could call it that dog in him a little bit. And you need that when you're playing in corner, you know, you, you, you got to have it or else you're going to be burnt toast. So I think Quinion's got it for sure. Great press conference today from him. He's an impressive young man. I'm really impressed by him uh, so far. I like what I've seen so far. So hopefully he has a, a good, a good season and he backs up this type of this talk and this camp so far. Let me tell you how Brady was a shit talker. So Tom Brady, what's the one thing he does every single April every year? He posts his draft picture going in the seventh round or sixth yeah. round where he looks like Ichabod Crane, and he looks like one of them old fat guys there at, a, at yeah. the deli serving you up a hoagie, okay? He's, it's, a, it, it, it's a mindset. Can you imagine living in Wellington, Florida? You're only 15 minutes away from the campus of the University of Florida. They don't even send a guy to go recruit you. Holy cow, would I have a fucking ass with that? My entire career that would fuel me to where you never, and then they came back after, obviously, when he was at Toledo and wanted him to come to Florida. He wanted nothing to do with that loser, Billy Napier. He wanted nothing to do with that. And here's a guy, again, his journey is a cool journey, but yeah. he, you know what he has? He's, he's a scoreboard kid. Yeah, he is. And that's a good thing. And he's loyal. I mean, he stayed at Toledo. You heard Nick Saban, yeah, you know, on the on the panel that one time saying, Yeah, we tried to get him, you know, in the in the portal to come to Alabama. And uh he didn't want to come. So I like that about him. I mean, I, I would have understood if he left. I mean, I wouldn't have it wouldn't have been a knock on him, but the fact nope. that he stayed, I think, is a positive thing. Um, and he's showing a lot, man. I think he's got a, the potential for Quinion Mitchell is very high coming into the season. I hope he lives up to it. Don't you know? Don't start reading your own headlines. Stay humble. Stay hungry, young man. And I think the 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 sky is the limit for him in this in the in this team and in this league. This is so important, and I'm going to reemphasize it again. Corner, nickel, slot, dime. They're they're putting him in all these. There's a clear emphasis that Vic wants him on the field, 
I don't believe Howie has anything to do with this because, believe me, he drafted a corner. He didn't draft a nickel or dime or slot. That's a Vic. That's Vic's work. Okay. That's Vic doing that. Yeah. That's not because when you ask Howie, Howie will tell you, no, no, we kind of drafted uh, Cooper DeGene to be on the numbers and be a corner. Well, I'll tell you what, if Vic don't see that, he ain't playing there. That's He's going to play where Vic puts him and he gives the team the best chance to win. And, you know, again, I mean, boy, that's seeing the middle of the field, seeing the hash marks, seeing the releases on tight ends and backs coming out of the backfield. He's giving him such a crash course in how you look at defense. Plus, you know what else you get to do, Xander? It's a different technique of free, strong, nickel, slot, and corner. You have to have different feet movement. You have to have different backpedaling. Like I tell people, playing right guard and left guard, yeah, it's different. Completely different than what I you know. think. You just don't slug guys in like that. Yeah. It's different hands. It's different punching. It's different sliding. When you got to go slide protect, it's it's not that easy to do something like that. He was even asked a question at the presser. He goes, "Hey, man, do you ever do slot when you were at Toledo?" He goes, "I never played slot." Yeah, you know how he, he found out. A little out? bit surprised they moved him there. Yeah, you don't know. You know how he found out. He was walking out to practice, and they said, "You're going to play some slot today, too." And he's like, "Okay, wherever they want." And I'm like, "Holy shit!" That's like them asking him to go play wide out. Yeah, I was who's like, your best connection for a cornerback that's been in this league? I'm sorry. Who's your best connection for a cornerback that's been in this league that you could potentially get on the show? I think that would be tremendous to talk about that stuff right there. Rod Woodson. Yeah, I mean, anybody you can get, I think, would be a great add to the show. Just, just to talk about this. I mean, you're so right. It's so underrated that he's able to do this. And Vic talked about it a little bit. How he's like, I'm going to throw a lot at these guys early and see what they can handle. Quinion's apparently been able to handle everything and doesn't look bad doing it. Looks pretty good doing it. Um, and to have a guy like that is interesting. And this is, you know, I don't want to turn it negative, but this is what I'm upset about with Cooper DeGene. You know. He, we don't we're not learning a more uh, enough about that player and i think you know vic isn't learning a lot about him because how much does vic fangio know about quinion mitchell now that well, he, he didn't know a week ago at iowa i mean this is incredible stuff vic fangio is probably drooling lo looking at this guy holy shit we got a 22 year old guy that can i can line up anywhere in the back end of the defense i mean remember he played some freaking dime linebacker this is a guy they've moved all over the field, and he's handled it with ease all over the place. So uh, good stuff from Quinion Mitchell, man. But hopefully Cooper gets out there soon because I'd like to see the same treatment given to him and see how he handles it too. You know what I'm going to do too? Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think I got um, I think I think got Aeneas Williams as number two. So we'll get somebody like that on who was a Hall of Fame uh, corner. I got I, – I, I have um, – um, I got a bunch of guys here. I think I got Aeneas. Yeah, I think yeah, I got Aeneas Williams. So we'll get somebody like that. That's a great idea in how you play cornerback. Aeneas Williams, you may not know the name, but Aeneas Williams is a Hall of Fame player. Played for the Cardinals. He was a heck of a football player. So um I like the fact that AJ is after the practices. I think that, you know, you get this, hey man, when you get your hands inside, always remember you're trying to get people to have release inside, not outside it, because if guy going down the sidelines, he's got your beat. So he's, you know, he's saying that he's teaching him and telling him always have a wide receiver go back to traffic. And again, that's essential, Xander. When you've got somebody like AJ going, don't give up your outside shoulder because when you start giving up your outside shoulder, that's when you're going to end up getting beat. So at the end of the day, you've got these legendary players now working with these corners. I can't tell you how important that is to have somebody like that working with these younger players. I agree. Do you, do you still have me, by the way? Am I internet? Yeah, no, I see you going in and out. You're all good. I, I, I got you. We're good. You can hear me, though, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. No, you're right. Definitely, for sure. So, mm -hmm. we'll see. You know, I think it's going to be a big year for these young guys, and there's a lot of young cornerbacks, Dan, that I think can take from take, take some of these lessons and apply them, and it applies to Keely Ringo. It applies to even Isaiah Rogers, who was out of football for a year. So, it's good to see that they have coaching out there, real coaching, that's showing them stuff that matters. Uh, hopefully they can all answer the call because we're, you know, team is relying on them this year to have a big year for sure. So uh, hopefully they can do it. And I, and I think it's going to be a good year for them. I didn't ask you this yesterday. Last one here for you. You know, 
supposedly Justin Simmons and the Eagles are in contact. I'm not saying there's a deal, but I'm saying that they have had conversation. Now, do you, do you, is that a if you believe you're a Super Bowl team, that's a Super Bowl move, Xander. Mm. Is it, I don't think you have a Super Bowl defense right now. Yeah, but is that the ad that makes you a Super Bowl defense? Okay, so let me ask you this. You have Quinion Mitchell at corner. You have Justin Simmons, who led the last three years the NFL in, in interceptions. And you have um, Avante Maddox and you have Slay. How's that secondary look when you put those three together? It's good. I just don't know how much of an ad or an, an improvement that that he would be a thirty-one year old Justin Simmons. How much of an improvement is he over Reed Blankenship? I'm not look a, a lot. He's better than him. I, He's second team All Pro last year. Yeah, maybe. I just I don't know. I feel I feel good about that about that safety position better than most people do. Maybe it's because John's told me that they look pretty good out there. But I don't know. I mean, you're right. I think a move should be made. I just don't know where it is. I think it's more depth on the defensive line. I really do. I, I I don't I don't I mean, you know, this is a good point here from Bob Brown. I hope I'm not cutting out. I know my internet sucks. Sorry, everybody. Hey, we Zander, can hear you though. We got okay. you. Okay. Adding Simmons allows the kids to have a player coach on the field who knows Vic's system. That's fair. I mean, you know, maybe I have PTSD from this guy. What a joke he was last year. He didn't do a damn thing for this team last year, Kevin Byard. He didn't do a damn thing. And I heard the same shit. Oh, he's an all pro. He's this. He's that. He sucked. He did nothing. I think he made us worse. I, <laughs> I think we went. I think we got worse when he got here. Literally, you know. I so I don't know. I, you know. So you'd I, I, listen. I don't think you're wrong here. I, I don't. Yeah, I'm just saying that he'd be a one year deal, Xander. And when I'm not talking about future stuff, but so you want to play the young guys, and you want to get it out of the way. And by the way, you might be ten and seven. But you might be a 14-win look team when December comes. That, to me, is how I want to look at it. Like I said to you a couple days ago, Kansas City looked like a nine-win team the first nine games of the year. They looked like a 14-win team the last month of the season, and they were playing like a 14-3 and team. You know what I'm yeah. saying? I mean, yeah. okay, that, to me, is how you win Super Bowls. Yeah, I mean, look, I get the debate. So, you know, for the people saying it shouldn't even be debated or whatever, I get it. I, I mean, I, I see the other side. I'm kind of just trying to view it from almost a devil's advocate point of view where you're just like, uh, I, I, if you get Justin Simmons, does he immediately catapult your defense to a Super Bowl contending defense? I don't think so. Maybe he does. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm open to being wrong. I don't, I'm not trying to be right on everything I say up here. Believe me, I know I'm not. Uh, I just don't I don't think that's the ad that makes you a Super Bowl contender. I think it's a perfect world and it's a perfect scenario and you need it to all play out in your favor. But if you get guys like Reed, Cooper, uh Quinion Mitchell, CJ Garner, if all of these guys can live up to their potential this year, that is a that is a Super Bowl caliber defense. Adding a 31-year-old guy like I don't know. I'm like done with the old man, with the old, with the older players. I, you know, we've, we've, we've had Robert Quinn. We've had Kevin Byer. Now, none of these guys really work that well, especially when they get older. And, and I just don't know if bringing them in now makes sense. That's How about all. this? Well, the reason why you bring up Justin Simmons, Bradbury's on the team. What's yeah, his? True. Okay. He's on the team for a reason. Vic wants him there. Okay. I mean, you can't think the Eagles want him on that roster. Yeah, I mean, that's it, Justin Simmons is a replacement for for Bradbury. Yeah, two thirty-one year old guys. One, One Justin's guy gonna, Justin will, will will want to be a starter though. But remember something he, d different than Kevin Byard. The last three years in the NFL, he has more interceptions than any safety in the league. I mean, it's yeah. he's been productive. We're not talking about a guy who's on the downside here. Good point, Joshua. You're right about that. Slay's still playing good ball in his 30s. I mean, I get it. I, you know, I just, I don't know. I, it's I, not I as get demanding as a as a corner. It's corner is very demanding. I get a little fearful of like the patchwork where you. Go I hate for the guy. old guys too. I do. I, no, no. I, I see. I don't hate the old guys. I hate the old guys when you think they're gonna like make you a Super Bowl contender. 
when you have a team that's really good and you add guys like Nadama Kung Su and Linval Joseph, who are both north of 30 for depth pieces and for rotation and to value, that I love. That I think gives you a chance to get over the edge. But when you when you tell me you're going to bring in Justin Simmons, who's 31, and all of a sudden your defense is going to be a Super Bowl caliber defense, top 10 or top 15, I just I, I have a hard time buying that. Like I said, I might be wrong. I might be dead wrong, and I'm okay with that. That's just how I see it right now, that I don't think Justin Simmons is going to be the type of value add that some people think he's going to be. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he would be that guy, but I don't almost feel better going in with the young guys, letting them get up there, letting them get up to speed, letting them play and seeing what they're capable of doing. If they're, if they don't, if they stink, make a move at the deadline. I mean, I, you know, and it gets the same thing. I don't know if, I don't know if I see bringing in Justin Simmons now. I don't see that the same way where it's like, okay, now we got a Super Bowl defense because we upgraded from Reed Blankenship. He's not the weak link on defense. He's not. He's not great. I know he's not an all pro, but he's not the weak link on this defense. The weak link on this defense is the linebacking core and the depth on the roster. And the inexperience. And the inexperience, exactly. Okay, remember that. That is sometimes more important than even like Zach Bond or any of these other guys. That's I true. Mean, That's because, good point. I mean, okay, experience is the reason why Bradbury's on the team. He's not better than Mitchell. He's not better. You, there's not a chance, talent wise, that Bradbury's better than Quinion Mitchell. But you know what he is? He does know where to go. Yeah, it's true. He does I mean, know where to line up. I'm not saying Simmons isn't a good player. I, I agree. He 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 is a good player. Uh, I you know, like I said, I just struggle with the idea that he's going to completely change who we are as a defensive football team. I, I don't completely agree like with Prince yeah. here on this one. That he does help that weak linebacking core back there being a better tackler. Yeah, that's there. true. He is a better. Justin Simmons is a better tackler than Brad uh, than uh, Reed Blankenship. Okay, he is a better That's true. That's true. It's a good point by Prince, who has a lot of good points. Appreciate you, Prince. Uh, you this know? is interesting too. Prince says, "Watch Simmons tape from last year." Okay, Ronald, I'm out. I'm on the show. So tell me what you saw. Was it good or was it bad? I don't. He was really what? good. Yeah, was he? Yeah. All right. But then I mean... again, he was really good when Miami put up seventy on him. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. It's not so true. Hey, we started remember old. this. I mean, Miami dropped the 70 burger on that team. <laughs> wait, so here's the other question, though, I have. All right, so last year he played 15 games. The year before that, he played 12 games. Other than that, he's been pretty good on the injury front. Um, here's the other question I have with Justin Simmons. If he's so damn good, why the hell is he still in the market? Because he's he can pick and choose what he wants to do. Is that really it, though? Yeah. He's not going to just sign with a team, Xander. No, no, he no, 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 He's no, got no. multiple people licking at him and wanting him to be on a team. Yeah, and, 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 and I got news for you. None of them are giving him the type of money that he wants, and well, that's, we'll why somebody gets held, hurt. that's why he's held out to this point. If somebody came to him in the free agency window open and said, hey, here's three years and $50 million, I guarantee you Justin Simmons wouldn't be on the market right now. How do you know he's not looking for the best of both worlds where he wants to win a ring? And he also he might be, but money. that, but if that's the truth, which I think it is, that would insinuate he's past his playing prime. Yeah. He's got one year left. Well, he's 30. I think he's got a couple more than one years left, but I think he's past that stage. Cause if he was still the type of player that everybody is saying he is, maybe he is. Mm -hmm. I, like I said, I might be freaking wrong. I don't, I don't know, but the fact that he's still in the market, I, you know, I get it. There's the, some of these older players like to pick and choose. and But that's like what, what Sue did and what Cam Hayward did. These are guys who are know that they're well past their days of getting a big contract, and they wait for the right team to get the right opportunity. That's a different, that's a different scenario than saying I'm 30 and I'm, a, and I'm an all-pro caliber player. If you're an all-pro caliber player, you would have been picked up by now. And somebody would have given you the money that you wanted because there's a lot of teams in this league that could use all pro talent on their defense. But the fact that nobody's done it, nobody's gone there, we're just going to sit here and say it's because Justin Simmons wants to wait? I don't know about that one. I don't think anybody in their right mind, no matter how rich you are, wants to just say, I'm going to wait to take that bag of money. I don't think the bag of money ever came. You know, and I think I that's part always... of the reason now he's like, okay, I'll wait for the right team. It's a good pivot. 
And you got a guy on your football team that was graded the worst corner in the league making 12 million. Who's that? James Bradbury? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that's a different scenario because he was already on this roster. If I cut him, I saved 9 million. My point is is that money sometimes dictates a lot of how teams are going to react to bringing in a player and how a player sees what he wants to do. Personally, he's not chasing a bag of money, dude. He's chasing opportunity and money. That's yeah, not, but, but you're not going to get the best the player. You're not that, at 30 years old. You're not going to get the best of both worlds. Okay. So my point is if you're that much of an impact of a player, though, a team is going to give you the money. Look at, look at who's the dude who just got signed from the giants. Xavier McKinney. He was like, good, but he's 18 not like million. 18 million. The green Bay gave him 18 million bucks, 18 million. He's not an $18 million player. My point was, people were like, I need a guy. Go go give him the money. That's what teams do in the NFL. And nobody gave him the money. He's 30. He's not even 31 yet. He's 30 years old. It's like Hassan Reddick. Hassan, I know you're great. I know you're better than 14 and a half. But the market dictates it. If you're not worth $25 million because not a single team in the league will pay it to you, you're not worth $25 million. And that's where I kind of think Justin Simmons might be. Like I said, I don't know. I, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he is that good of a player. I just feel like if he was that good of a player that he turned us into a Super Bowl caliber team that quickly, he wouldn't be sitting on the market here in, at the end of July. Yeah, I was right. We're talking about a safety here too. Yeah, safety don't have crazy. big markets. Exactly. Okay. I, mean, I don't know. I'm just you're not saying, getting a ton of money playing safety. I'm not saying Justin Simmons is a bad player for everybody saying. I know you're not. You're not. I, I yeah, get it. But, but you know how it is. I mean, I I no, just how he looks like the he, economics too. And I don't think he's a cure all. I don't think he. I don't think he does for this defense what some people think he might do, and that's make us like a, you know all of a sudden a perennial Super Bowl contender because we signed a 30 year old guy that nobody else in the league wants for the price he wants. Uh, you know, Xander. Great stuff. You guys are doing a special show right after this one, too, right? Yep. With John Mc- you and John McMullen are doing a special Birds 365, right? Yes, sir. 6 to 8 p.m. tonight. So, again, and fantastic stuff. John's been uh, sending and Xander's been posting some really great content here on Jacob. Make sure you go over and check it. Xander, by the way, how many likes we got here, man? We got 199 big sales right now. Holy cow. Let's see if we can get to 300 Yeah, likes. 300. I like it. How about this? We go from you and what John McMullen is. We go to our own Fox 29, uh, Gary Cobb. Cobb. Thank you, Xander. And I've been dying to wait to hear what Gary Cobb has had to say because Gary Cobb's been out there too, and he's been watching.